Okay, everyone is coming. It's great to see all of you. Thank you for joining us. Let's start. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Kazakhstan American Corners program. Today is our fourth session and adult speaker series. Uh, we're really excited to have all of you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sultanat. I am coordinator of American Corner in Nur Sultan. And I will be with you along with my colleague behind the scene, the son, who will be serving you as a moderator. You can ask the question in a chat box and he will try to uh, answer you. Okay, so today, like I said before, is a fourth session in our speaker series and we will talk about the cultural shock. My experience in, uh, I mean, Mr. Og experience living in four uh, distinctly different states within the US, which uh, session from that list that you see here, um, you most uh, liked. I mean, we already have four of them and we also have one more. Let us know in the comments. By the way, today we're gonna have, uh, as usual, 20 for 25 minutes uh, of the session. And then other 20 min minutes will be for question and answers. You can ask all of the questions during the session or during the Q&A. Now, let's remember our rules. Uh, please turn off your microphone, then our internet connection will be more stable. If you have any question, be active. Uh, don't be shy. Then uh, the meeting is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. By the way, we have the all previous recordings already on our YouTube. It's called Kazakhstan American Corners. Please follow us, subscribe, attend at least three out of five sessions to receive an official certificate. So now I'd like to hand you over to our virtual English language fellow, US Department of State program in Nur Sultan, August Gamsi. Welcome, August, hi. Hello there, uh, th thank you, uh, Sultanat, for uh, the warm introduction and welcome. Uh, good evening to uh, all of our participants from uh, across Kazakhstan. Uh, very nice uh, to see everyone again. If this is your first time joining us in this series, uh, thank you. If uh, this is uh, not your first time uh, with this series, thank you for joining us again. Um, so as Sultanat mentioned, today we're going to be going over uh, focusing on culture shock. Uh, today. So I'm really excited to share my experience uh, again with everybody. As she mentioned the format, I will probably talk um, today. I'll probably aim for about 25 minutes. Um, so probably about uh, by eight o'clock, I think I'll wrap up and we'll be able to begin the Q&A. So please, you know, be active. I want to encourage you if you do uh, come up with some questions while I'm talking. Um, I probably won't be able to answer maybe questions while I'm talking, but definitely at the end, we'll have our question and answer session. So you do not need to wait till the end to post your questions into the chat. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen and my presentation with everybody. Mm -hmm. Cool, we can see your presentation and it's full screen. Thank you. Okay, so that way, so uh, again, today's title, uh, the topic and the presentation title itself is Culture Shock, my experience living in four distinctively different states uh, within the US. Okay. And now also by attending this event, just so everybody know that you may be photographed, okay? I think we're all kind of used to screenshots now with whatever we're doing, work, lessons, school, um, and this uh, potentially these pictures may be used for promotional usages uh, through the US Department of State programs, exchanges, and other kind of diplomacy efforts. Okay. Now, um, for those of you maybe that are new joining us this very first time, again, my name is August Garnsey, and I am the Virtual English Language Fellow for Nursal Pond. Um, I do have a master's in TESOL, and my undergraduate work was actually in business management. Uh, I am a career changer before teaching. I actually was a bank manager, and I got to discuss some of that kind of experience in previous sessions within this uh, webinar series. A couple other things that I do right now, um, I currently, part of my responsibilities as a fellow, I do teach 
graduate and undergraduate courses at Eurasian National University in Nur Sultan, as well as I work with some fantastic groups of teenagers around Kazakhstan through the State Department's English Access Microscholarship Program. I just got through finishing up before with a terrific group uh, in Kazigurt in South Kazakhstan. And now I just started working with a great group in Uralsk. So it's real nice to be able to work with different young, brilliant minds, great teenagers across Kazakhstan, all across uh, the Great Republic. And as well as one of my highlights always I love to do is my sessions here uh, with Sultanat at American Corners. And I do have some previous experience in Kazakhstan. I actually used to live in Kochsikau, um, just before, uh, well, this last academic year, I was an international English teacher there for Nish in Kochsikau. Okay, all right. So I do have a little survey that I would just like all of our uh, many participants to be able to complete. I'm gonna go and put into the chat right now a link to a form. And if you could please fill out this form, that would be fantastic. Okay. Let me go ahead and actually hold on one moment. It, it often never works here. Let me go ahead and try this again. Let me copy the link. Okay. Okay. All right. So there we go. I have the link in the chat now. So everybody, please, you can just fill that one out. I really greatly appreciate that helps me to get to know everybody that's with us right now and help to plan for future sessions, okay? So where I wanna begin with us is, let's start with some associations, okay? So when you think of the United States of America, okay? In the chat, I would like everyone to write what comes to your mind. It could be any kind of you know, places, people, things, events, Etc. So again, whatever comes to your mind when you think of the U.S., please put in the chat right now. I'd like to take a look to see what you associate with. Let's see what we have. Okay, yeah, let's see. I see some responses in the chat here. Okay. What comes to your mind? Someone said democracy, Hollywood, hamburger, New York, Hollywood again, fast food, freedom, U.S. dollars, <laughs> <laughs> state of liberty, good, New York again, perfect, big economy, hip hop, cool, presidents, movies, Obama, KFC, <laughs> really, <laughs> the museums, cool, I like this one, opportunities, perfect, wow, freedom. Wow. Wow. Most of them about freedom, democracy, happy and free people. I like this one. <laughs> great, great. Well, these these are really yeah, this uh, terrific kind of responses here. Um, you know, some of them I was kind of like expecting to see. You know, and some of them maybe more. I mean, of course, you know, uh, you know, mentioning U.S. dollars, of course, you know, and you know, economics, but you know, other the other aspects too. You know, democracy and food okay you know definitely you touched on maybe some favorites i know that when when i visited and i was in uh nurse sultan i did go to a uh, kfc uh in nurse sultan <laughs> go to kfc here in the, in the u.s but i do like to i do like to try some of these kind of like these american chains in other countries you know and, and actually i find that maybe the food's actually possibly better in other countries in these american chains than they are here in the u.s so but thank you everybody for providing that insight into your associations with the US, okay? So now that we kind of, you know, got an idea of what we think of the US, um, let's go ahead and kind of focus in on our topic, which is about, you know, culture shock. And what is culture shock, okay? And I think most of us have a pretty good idea, uh, some kind of already perception of, you know, what is culture shock? Um, a lot of us maybe associate culture shock specifically with like going to other countries. But, you know, however, culture shock can happen within country. You know, for instance, you know, the Republic of Kazakhstan is a very large country. And 
even, you know, I didn't get to travel as much as I wanted to due to COVID and uh, um, travel plans were interrupted and limited, but I was still able to go to some different regions in Kazakhstan. And I can definitely see, you know, some differences. And likewise, in the U.S., the U.S. is a very large place as well. And you can experience culture shock there too within the country itself. So kind of a broad kind of maybe just to provide a description for everybody. So we'll kind of make sure we all understand together here. So I would say culture shock, you know, it's that feeling of disorientation, you know, um, confusion, maybe frustration, you know, that's experienced by someone who suddenly is subjected to these unfamiliar things around us in our environment, like culture, way of life, maybe different set of attitudes, okay? Now, maybe some of you maybe are aware of these different stages, but most studies will say there's about four different stages to culture shock. And um, coming up here in this presentation, I will kind of maybe kind of show you uh, and describe maybe some of these stages and how this kind of worked for me in the different places that I lived within the US. But, you know, it starts with the honeymoon stage, okay, that great stage in the beginning where everything's great, wonderful, like euphoria, it seems like nothing can't go wrong, there's the excitement of new things, you know, then comes in the frustration part, you know, some of that confusion, maybe a little bit of some disorientation, you know, then you need to adjust to things, and then, of course, it's your part about acceptance, okay, so there's definitely some clear stages and culture shock that need to be worked through. And as I kind of tell you my experience of being in so many different places, I have gone through these stages many times, again and again and again, okay? Now, one other thing too that, you know, maybe to keep in mind when it comes to going to unfamiliar places, being in unfamiliar situations and environments, um, you know, kind of goes along with maybe some culture shock is the proverb, you know, think about when in Rome, do as the Romans do you know, which, and maybe you have heard of this kind of phrase. Basically, you can, for those that aren't familiar with it, you can say that it's basically like, if, if you don't really quite know what to do where you're at, just kind of follow others around you that seem to kind of know what to do, okay? So just kind of following some others. So when in Rome, do as the Romans do, okay? And I definitely have that experience before going to many different places. When I first came to Kazakhstan, you know, kind of like if I didn't know what was going on, just look around me, see what other people are doing in Kazakhstan and just kind of maybe follow other people. <laughs> so hopefully that kind of worked out for me. For some of us, that's a good strategy. For some of us, maybe it doesn't work out. Okay, so let's kind of go ahead and get into this, you know, this, all this travels that I did, okay? And just so everybody knows, okay, I did kind of mention this in some of my previous webinars, about kind of the different places that I've been in and kind of my path that I've traveled. Now, just so you know, so I put on the screen here, the four different states that I lived in and in that order. So from California to Florida, to Tennessee to Illinois, okay? And of course, you know, then to Kazakhstan and then back to the US again. And so I have been in some different places uh, over the past 15 years, quite a few distinctive places, okay? So let's start first with this kind of journey here in San Francisco, okay? And in San Francisco, California, this is where I was born and raised. Um, so I grew up and spent a lot of time in the San Francisco Bay Area. And as you can see, it's a very large city. I put the population up there for the city, which is a little over 800,000 people. And then the greater kind of metropolitan area has uh, 4.7 million people. So it's a very large place that I grew up in. And most people, when they think about San Francisco, the first thing that comes to your mind, of course, is, you know, you think of like tech and more technology. Okay. In Silicon Valley, a lot of people think about, you know, these tech giants, such as like Google and Apple, and Facebook, um, you know, and there's some other obvious things that make San Francisco a very kind of distinctive place. Obviously, if you visited there, you can tell that there's a very strong kind of this, you know, Asian influence in San Francisco, especially like East Asian and like Southeast Asian, very strong influence there. But one of the lesser known things, you know, when I start to compare, you know, kind of the experiences of being in different places is 
that actually there's a really strong Pacific Islander community uh, throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. And all the different places that I've lived, I've never actually kind of experienced that kind of group of individuals. You know, growing up, I had many friends and people I knew that were from Pacific Islands, such as like Fiji and Tonga and Samoa. You know, when you go to other places, and a lot of people don't get to meet individuals from those islands. So it's a very kind of unique experience um, growing up there with that. Now, other things you can see from my pictures, I have many pictures I posted here kind of in this collage. For instance, the bottom, you can see Chinatown, you know, this great, strong cultural center that really kind of, it just has thrived in San Francisco, has a real big influence and impact on people and things that go on in San Francisco. Iconic images that help kind of shape your mind and your perspective of San Francisco, things like the Golden Gate Bridge, Coit Tower, Lombard Street, which maybe I think they say it's like the most crookedest street in the world. I don't, I don't know I mean, how they can kind of judge that, but that's kind of the thing is it says it's the most crookedest street. You can see it just zigzags, goes back and forth. And it's actually like a really steep hill. And speaking of the hills, the hills in San Francisco are just something that really kind of impacts the life there that make it very unique. I haven't lived in such a hilly place uh, since my time in San Francisco, you can kind of see some of the steep hills in some of these pictures. For instance, in the bottom, you can see in the background Alcatraz, the cable car coming up the hill. Very iconic type of image of San Francisco that leaves a lasting impression on you. And wine country, you know, maybe you've heard about wine country, you go across the Golden Gate Bridge. And on the other side over here is the beautiful wine country of the San Francisco Bay Area. And something else that it's kind of more notorious for is earthquakes, okay? And that's left a kind of an impression on me. So, you know, I, I gathered this experience growing up in San Francisco Bay Area. Obviously, it's very well known. When we asked for your associations with the U.S., a lot of you said, you know, New York City, you know, which is a lot of people associate with the U.S. with it. Kind of they have an idea of what the U.S. is through New York City, but there's a lot of different places a lot of distinctive places in the US. And I will continue to share kind of some of that uniqueness and distinctiveness as I kind of talk about a few of the other places that I've lived in. Okay, so next after growing up in San Francisco, I moved to Tampa, Florida. And going to Florida was my first real experience of culture shock. Okay, um, really just, you know, the first thing that really hit me and a lot of people when they go to a new place that's unfamiliar with them, especially if somebody say went to the northern part of Kazakhstan for the first time, weather. So I mean, you know, my weather world was just kind of, you know, rocked here when I went to Florida, you know. So, but the first thing you notice in Florida is a lot of water. Okay. And you can kind of see from some of these pictures, Florida, the sunshine state, a lot of sunshine all, all year round. You can see the beaches, the bays, the pictures of the Gulf of Mexico, you know, that kind of picturesque kind of vacation type of spot that maybe a lot of you might dream about or want to go to, especially during the winter time, because it's quite warm and nice here in Florida during the, during the winter time as of right now. Um, one thing that's really kind of unique about Florida and Tampa, you know, is the people. There's a lot of tourists. Um, so, you know, you can just kind of go around town and you can see a lot of diversity, a lot of people from different places. Also, there's a lot of people that actually are temporary residents. Florida has a ton of people that live here temporarily. What I mean by that is from like Canada and some of the northern states within the U.S., during the winter time, they all move to Florida um, to kind of get away from that harsh winter weather and some of the more northern parts like that. And we call them snowbirds, okay? So they're called snowbirds, the ones that come just temporarily during the winter time. And that helps to shape kind of the experience in Florida, especially during the winter time. Um, and other things that were really distinctive about Florida was the wildlife, which is absolutely incredible. And the wildlife can also really have an impact on somebody, you know, through, culture shock, you know, because growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, I didn't quite have as much of this 
you know, nature and as much of this variety of this exotic type of wildlife that I did in Florida. You can see here, my friend, Mr. Alligator. Okay, it's an alligator, guys, not a crocodile. We do have crocodiles in the US, but they're very, very small amounts, just kind of off the, the very southern tip of Florida, kind of more close to like Miami in that area. We have a few saltwater crocodiles, but alligators are freshwater animals. And so they're all in like our lakes and our rivers and ponds and any kind of like smaller bodies of water throughout the state of Florida. Really kind of plays a part, you know, I, I always am tempted to, you know, in San Francisco, I would just go down to a river or lake and swim and it's fun, it's nice, but you know, you can't do that in Florida. You know, it changes the way you do things outside because you can't really go into the water like that. You gotta be very cautious because of how many alligators there are uh, everywhere in Florida. So it's always something to be cautious about when around kind of fresh water and the presence of alligators. Now, other things about that make Florida kind of distinctive and unique um, was things like, obviously I mentioned about the weather, but the sky and the clouds really helped paint this kind of beautiful picturesque place in Florida. You can see some of the pictures here with the cloud formation in the sky. It's really quite this beautiful phenomenon that in other places I've lived, I didn't quite get to notice such a dynamic kind of cloud formation. So if, if you are uh, into those kinds of things that, you know, it's a really kind of unique thing about Florida. And another thing that makes Florida really unique when you talk about people is that Florida is very close to the Caribbean. I think that the Caribbean islands is something that maybe to people of Kazakhstan, kind of an unknown thing. You know, in Florida, I have many experiences, many friends, people that I know, you know, from the Caribbean islands, such as like Puerto Rico and Jamaica, you know, in Cuba, Dominican Republic, and, uh, from Haiti. So, you know, I got to meet a lot of great people from those places that, you know, just by my location of Florida, you know, I had the opportunity to meet them where in other places around the world, maybe I don't have those opportunities. Um, so that really helped create a very nice kind of different vibrant type of culture, you know, with the people that are here, plus the influences from like South America are uh, very prevalent in Florida. Now, moving past Florida and kind of this tropical getaway here, I went to, Tennessee, okay, and specifically I was living in Memphis, Tennessee. So in Memphis, Tennessee, um, really, real great place. You know, it's, it was one of, the, it was the more smaller of the places that I had lived in. You can see the population here, a little over 650,000 people and about 1.3 million in like the total kind of greater, larger metro area in Memphis, definitely smaller than like San Francisco and, and the Tampa Bay area. Um, but a very nice place, you know, if I mention Memphis, I got to go right to about the food and barbecue. For those of you that are really into barbecue, Memphis is really just some of the best. You can see the picture up here. Memphis style ribs. Okay, they do like this dry rub. Okay, and they put like the seasoning in there. Um, not so much of a heavy kind of vinegar base, but a little bit more kind of maybe sweet um, type of taste to it. But if you ever go to Memphis, you got to try you know, the Memphis style kind of dry rub baby back ribs are fantastic, you know, but going past food, music, I, I always kind of just, once I got to Memphis and I got to live there and experience things, you know, part of the shock was about this musical heritage, you know, that a lot of people don't know worldwide about Memphis. It's not such like a, you know, widely known type of place, you know, it's a big city, but it's not, you know, uh, if you ask people around the world, maybe they haven't really heard of Memphis, they know probably about, you know, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. They probably heard of Elvis, you know, and his Graceland home and mansion and everything here for Elvis. This is kind of, the, you know, the center, the focal point of all the Elvis Presley culture, the king of rock and roll here in Memphis. You know, you see a lot of music stuff, like this mural on the wall. You know, you can see old kind of these really significant places like Sun Studio records still standing here. It's more of like a museum now. You can see down here the Rock and Soul Museum of Memphis. Memphis has like, I always like to kind of label it's kind of like, you know, American, you know, rock and soul and like folk music. I always like to kind of feel like 
Memphis is kind of the heart and soul of a lot of events. And you'll get that experience and feeling. And it was something very different. You know, San Francisco was like technology, you know, innovation. And in Florida, you know, you have tourism. But then I came to Memphis and I really got this feel for like some of the heart of American music. Okay? And it was a very nice experience. Plus also Memphis is significant for the civil rights movement. They have the National Civil Rights Museum. Um, in the U.S., we just got through celebrating Black History Month in February. Um, it's very significant uh, to Memphis because of the connection, of course, with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was assassinated actually there. Um, so that was actually um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final place was in Memphis, and they have actually a museum here uh, for him. One other thing I want to mention about Memphis, very unique kind of distinctive thing, is they have this huge pyramid in Memphis. I guess you think about Memphis, you think about Egypt. Well, they play on that and they built a huge pyramid there on the river. Um, and actually, I think um, statistics say that it's like the 10th largest pyramid in the world, okay, is in Memphis, Tennessee, okay, comparing to other cultures and more historical type of pyramids, okay. So now once I left Memphis and I moved out of Tennessee, I went to Chicago, Illinois. And I think everybody kind of knows and has heard of Chicago huge place. You can see the population, very large city, almost 2.7 million in the city, almost 10 million people in like the greater metro area around Chicago, just a huge place, a nice mixture of urban and also suburbs. You can see some very kind of beautiful kind of iconic type of pictures I put here in this collage. The first thing I got to say that really had an impact on me in Chicago was the architecture. To be honest, I didn't really actually really pay attention a lot to architecture before in the previous places I was in. But when I got to Chicago, something really clicked and just this phenomenal thing, just this beauty. I went on this boat tour. It was an architecture boat tour. We went around the Chicago River, around the center part of town. And I got to see uh, and hear from um, a guide about all the impact, the people that made the buildings, you know, their influence on not just Chicago, but on the world when it came to architecture and design. There's many great schools of architecture that actually originated and came from Chicago. And Chicago has played its part around the world in the evolution of architecture. So it's a very significant thing in Chicago. Other things that were quite significant to me was there's a very strong Polish population. You know, the community is very strong. I believe actually Outside of Poland and the eastern part of Europe, Chicago actually has the largest and strongest type of Polish community. Um, and it was great for me because I have Polish ancestry and I was able to kind of connect and get to experience a lot of things uh, from Poland and Polish culture that I didn't get to experience anywhere else in other places. You know, and in San Francisco, you know, strong East Asian influence. In Florida, the Caribbean and Latin America, you know, and then I came to Chicago and more stronger ties to Europe, specifically Poland. Okay, so that was really something very significant to me. Um, now, other things I think about, you can see, you know, maybe if you know Kanye West and some of his music videos, he's from Chicago. You know, he would focus and show this little image in the center here. We call that the bean because it's shaped like a bean, but um, I think it's actually really called Cloud Gate. Okay, but kind of this iconic image, Buckingham Fountain, the elevated train system is just phenomenal. Some very iconic pictures of the train going through this all throughout town, kind of raised two or three stories high. Um, here's a picture of me uh, with uh, my Challenger and behind me, you can see, um, it used to be the tallest building in the world for a very long time, this is Willis Tower. Kind of reminds me of Gotham Tower from you know, the Batman comic series. So if you're familiar with Batman, kind of reminds me of Gotham Tower. And Deep Dish Pizza, if you ever go to Chicago, I mentioned about Memphis and their barbecue. I got to mention about Deep Dish Pizza in Chicago, okay? It's really thick. You got to use like a knife and a fork, uh, really good. So that was kind of my experience with my town. So kind of to wrap up, maybe I'll, I'm sure maybe you guys may ask these questions, but I'm going to kind of jump to it to kind of guide because maybe you're kind of curious. So where do I call home? If I'm really like thinking hard about, hmm, where do I call home? Well, I kind of like to always put it this way, maybe 
home is where you hang your hat, or maybe in a more personal manner, I could say, home is where the heart is, okay? And basically what I mean by that is, you know, becoming invested in the community. I mean, I could call Kazakhstan my home. Uh, I'm very invested in the community. I plan and hope to be in Nur Sultan for quite a while. And that way, you know, becoming invested is one way that, you know, you can really feel these roots and call someplace home. You don't necessarily have to have family. You don't have to have this history there. You know, it's about kind of your involvement uh, with people and events and things that go on. You know, if you're willing and open to new experiences and you got this positive mind frame, I mean, anywhere could be your home. And I've definitely had quite a few, as you can tell, over the past you know, 15 years. Now, the other thing I kind of want to mention before we kind of go into the Q&A session would be, what was my biggest challenge adapting to new places? And you're probably thinking like, hmm, you know, maybe right away you might kind of think language, and that is a big issue, you know, a language barrier. But, you know, in the U.S., I didn't really have that because I'm focusing on culture shock in the U.S. Now, there are some different accents that made it kind of difficult to sometimes understand Americans in different regions, you know, they have some kind of some different or stronger type of accents that maybe you're not really familiar with in Kazakhstan, like certain southern accents. But to me, the biggest challenge was weather. I feel that weather really shapes a way of life. You know, it shapes what people can do, when they do, how they do things. Weather is a big thing. And to me, this was one of my biggest challenges adapting to things. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's very mild. It's not too cold for too long, not too hot for too long, kind of just right. Um, there's a lot of fog. Um, so to me, I would consider it very mild, not nothing extreme. But then, you know, I went to Florida and had my weather world rock. I mean, it was just crazy, the heat, the humidity. For those that haven't been in tropical places, you probably would know what I mean. You know, rain can be monstrous at times. Um, you know, and again, hurricanes, tropical storms play a large part. Now, when I moved to Chicago, though, then I experienced extreme cold winters and, you know, you know, heavy kind of constant snow. Now, I want to tell about the story kind of quickly here uh, about me. And when I first moved to Chicago, it was in November. And actually, the very first weekend I was there in town, it was like the most heaviest snow on record they had in November. And I was just not prepared at all. I had no like snow shovel. I didn't have like snow gloves, you know, proper shoes, nothing like that. And my car was just buried in snow. So talk about not being prepared. So when I went to Northern Kazakhstan in Kaksatau, I was ready this time. Not like in this picture you can see, I actually had to wait quite a few days until the snow finally started to melt and go away before I could really even do anything trying to get my car uncovered from the snow. Um, but you know, no matter where you go, weather shapes the way you live. And to me, that's kind of one of the biggest challenges to adapting to a new place. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to share about my experience. So um, I want to thank everybody. You know, you guys can reach out to me via email uh, or Instagram. Uh, I don't mind if you have follow-up questions or anything like that. Um, I do have a little exit ticket for some feedback. I'll put this link into the chat for everyone. So uh, please, you know, respond to this, a little feedback survey as well before you go or after you can complete it as well too. It'll still be open uh, for a little bit after the session as well. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go into the Q&A now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sultanat um, to lead that session. Okay, I look forward to everybody's questions. Okay, thank you, August. Thank you for your presentation and sharing your experience. It was huge, yeah. Uh, let's see, we have some of the questions now. Uh, I would like to ask my colleague to share the presentation. You already answered a little bit and talked about it, but what is uh, the str strongest thing uh, for you when you, uh, strangest, when you arrived in Kazakhstan, sorry at first, I mean your first culture shock. You said weather, maybe someone else or first was something other thing? Um, yeah, no, this is, this is a great question because I, you know, 
before living uh, in Kazakhstan, I did actually visit before. Um, so I did have some experience before in Kazakhstan, which helped to prepare me and kind of ease me in a little bit better. So I didn't have like full-blown culture shock when I first came. But other than weather, um, you know, there was other things like, you know, the whole, you know, the, the, like kind of like daily routine types of things, you know, like getting more adjusted to, you know, taxis and trying to get taxis or kind of getting around town, you know, these things were kind of different, you know, finding out about different stores and trying to figure out how things work, you know, these were things that all kind of shocked me. Um, but, you know, I didn't have really strong culture shock when I lived there, but the first time that I visited here, the very first day, as soon as I got off the airplane, I mean, basically everything around me, the language was probably the biggest type of kind of culture shock that I had because not only did I not understand things, but you know, I couldn't um, you know, read for like Cyrillic, I couldn't read things around me. And that was actually kind of very, you know, it was a new experience for me not being able to actually even read things uh, around me. So that was kind of the first kind of really big type of culture shock I had uh, in Kazakhstan. Yeah, thank you, August. Um, the next one, uh, by the way, it was a question from Helen. Thank you, Helen, also for your question. Uh, the th next one is not actually a question, but just a mention, uh, interesting one uh, from Nur Sultan, I guess. Uh, he said, Astana and Memphis has something in common, pyramids. <laughs> and that's true. We also put here the uh, I mean, in Kazakh, it's called Bibitshirik Penkilisim Saraye. In English, it's Palace of Peace and Reconciliation. And the shape, it's like this one. <laughs> maybe uh, you saw it in, maybe you visited in Astana, August? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do uh, remember the pyramid. Yeah, so that is, that is actually a similarity, actually. And that is something that, you know, that Memphis has in common. You know, there's a lot of things about Memphis. A lot of people don't know, but it's, yeah, it's a real great place. And, the pyramid is just one of those kind of iconic things, just like the pyramid is in your Sultan. Mm, cool. Thank you, Nur Sultan, for your question. Thank you, August. Uh, okay, we have already like three, five, and more questions. Just give me a little bit time. We'll be put all together. Um, yep, yeah. August. Hello, everyone. How did you find uh, out that teaching is a mission of your life? Wow, it sounds so <laughs> like mission of your life. What kind of feelings help you to identify that? Well, you know, in, in some of the previous webinar sessions, I did kind of mention about my um, journey in some more details. But, you know, how did I find teaching? Well, I mean, it was something that really fit more to my character. And it was something that I kind of always did kind of like a part-time type of thing on the side, like some tutoring, you know, so I always had been involved um, in providing some kind of lessons or tutoring or coaching. I did a lot of coaching and training too through sports, you know, something I didn't mention before in my webinars. So I've always kind of enjoyed and embraced kind of this kind of leadership position to being kind of a mentor or an educator or a coach or a teacher. Um, and really, it's just something that really is matches my character and I can do kind of what I love. Uh, and really, it's a very rewarding experience. And that's what kind of brought me to teaching. There was a lot of different steps, maybe too many steps to name that actually got me to teaching. But really, the, the, what drove me to teaching was because it was a great fit for my character. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next question. Let's see. Uh, the next question is from Anar Sarsenova. She said that um, she asked at the second session, uh, I wanted to repeat the same question. Can Mr. August have a virtual meeting with local students where he will tell about the US and the teacher's profession? All the students are future English language teacher. Thank you very much in advance. She said. So, um, so we, yeah, so um, possibly now the thing about it is that there's um, with the uh, difference in time, you know, I do have kind of a, some more limited time right now. And so 
you know, Monday through Friday because, you know, I do everything in my morning, your evening, and I can't really do anything during the daytime because of our time difference. So I'm, I'm quite limited right now to my time kind of through Monday through Friday. I mean, I do have weekends, but um, potentially that could be something that maybe could be worked out, but it's kind of difficult uh, at the moment based on my scheduling. Thank you, August. And also we'd like to add something, Anar, uh, what if your students will join our sessions? I mean, right here, uh, this session, or if you already missed them, they can watch it on YouTube and join us after on other sessions too. I think it's a good idea, uh, like collaborating and working together here. Please mm -hmm. invite them, just invite to join us. Uh, we don't have such a age restriction for uh, online events, so it means that you can ask them to join. Yeah, and I already see that, that uh, she answered. Thank you. Okay, cool. We will wait your students. The next question is from Nur Sultan. I mentioned that Nur Sultan is very active user, very active participant. Thank you very much. Uh, since you mentioned to Chicago and Polish community. Did you know that Kokshetau had one of the largest Polish community in Kazakhstan in Soviet times? To be honest, me personally didn't know also. <laughs> did you know, August? I, I, I did hear about it actually, because you know, my my mom also, you know, she likes to try to find out more and connect to, you know, her Polish roots and ancestry. And yeah, that was something actually that my mom actually discussed and kind of checked into about, you know, that. Um, kind of that historical type of, you know, strong kind of large Polish community actually in the, you know, Akmola region and specifically like Pak Chikau. Um, So, you know, I didn't really have a lot of time to explore about that when I was in Pak Chikau, but I was aware of it. And, you know, when I go back to Kazakhstan, that would be maybe something I would like to explore going further. But, you know, thank you, uh, Nurse Sapan, for mentioning that. Yeah, that's a real, real nice point. Thank you, Nurse Sapan. Uh, yeah, we will share our knowledge, our knowledge, and now more, like this time. The next question is um, please, because you turn to the next question. We used to know that is it that this one? Yeah, we used to know that American people tend to smile a lot. That is, whereas is uh, Kazakhstan, we don't. Uh, what is a culture shock for you? <laughs> You know, that is actually a really interesting point because that will probably, you know, when I was living in Kazakhstan, you know, I was kind of kind of used to that kind of uh, custom. Now, I mean, I won't say that like nobody smiles. There's definitely lots of people mm -hmm. that, that smile in Kazakhstan, but I think I know what you mean kind of in the context of maybe in like the service like industry, like for service, you know, when I first, like the very first time, like when I visited Kazakhstan, you know, maybe like when I go to some stores, it's it's kind of hard maybe sometimes to, you know, read people kind of because, you know, you, I'm kind of as American, I was, I was looking for the smile to maybe indicate, you know, certain types of, you know, other type of context within communication, you know, so I'm looking at that as kind of like a nonverbal cue to certain things, you know, and I wasn't getting that. So sometimes it was kind of hard missing that kind of that part of your know, nonverbal communication that I grew up with. Um, so yeah, so that was something I had to kind of get uh, used to and stuff. But I want to say that, you know, people don't smile because I see lots of wonderful smiles uh, throughout Kazakhstan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, August. And thank you, Katerina, for your question. Let's smile more. Uh, <laughs> Karina asking this question. If you go to Taras, it's the cities in Kazakhstan, and then to Petropavlovsk, it's also the city. You also have the weather shock, <laughs> saying Karina. Uh, what other cities in Kazakhstan do you also visit? Visit it, except Astana and Kukshetau that we already know. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, in, you know, again, you know, like a lot of people, we had like maybe travel or vacation plans, you know, this past year, and those got interrupted. Um, but, you know, other regions I did get to go to, other than outside of, you know, of um, Nursultan and Kakshikau and the Akmola regions, um, North Kazakhstan, yeah, uh, Petropavlovsk, um, as well as in the southern part, uh, in Almaty. And also, too, I got to go to uh, Mangastau, 
you know, region. Or can I got to go to uh, Aktau? Um, yeah, so I got, you know, so I did get some real nice weather um, over in uh, Aktau kind of before I started like teaching. So, you know, that was really nice. Uh, then, you know, came all the harsh kind of winter weather in the northern part. Um, so, yeah, but when I go back to Kazakhstan, uh, definitely, I really plan to explore a lot more uh, and get to try to go to all the different regions in Kazakhstan. So if you guys have suggestions about where to go, you know, please let me know in the chat. Okay, thank you, August. Um, the next question is about food. And I would like to combine two questions, like mix them from Karina and so. Karina asking, what was your culture shock concerning food in Kazakhstan? Where are Sole asking, this might be strange question, but I will ask, <laughs> did you taste horse meat? If yes, how did you like it? And what about kumis? Okay, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we can put these kind of questions uh, together here. So, you know, when it comes to kind of, you know, culture shock, since that's our topic we're talking about, and you talk about food, yeah, that is probably always kind of like the obvious thing, you know, compared to specifically like to the U.S. because it's actually like, um, what, it's like illegal actually for, you know, for coarse meat. So, you know, definitely that was a uh, culture shock. And I definitely did buy, you know, horse meat. And it is, it's, it's, it's really good actually. I had, I had it in steak form. I mean, I threw Bramak. I mean, I, so I, I've had, you know, I, I had my fair share of, of horse meat and, you know, and it was good. And, you know, um, but that was definitely uh, something that really kind of shocked me, you know, seeing that I, it was just something I just, I just didn't grow up and I just didn't, it's just something that people didn't talk about even, you know, eating a horse. So that was quite something. Um, so when it comes to culture shock and food that uh, Kumis now, I, I did, tr I mean, I actually had already tried it before actually coming to Kazakhstan um, in Chicago. Uh, Chicago actually has fairly large kind of Central Asian communities. I was kind of active, uh, there was a, a Kyrgyz um, kind of like, you know, local community group. Um, and there was like a lot of Kazakh people there in that group as well too. Uh, and, you know, and I got to try like some of these foods like such as like Kumis uh, there already in Chicago. So I already had that experience. So, um, you know, I got the shock back in Chicago, but I, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, it was fine. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't have any kind of problem uh, with Kumis. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I tried it like a few more times, you know, when I was there in Kazakhstan, you know, and it's kind of thing though, maybe you, you, you have kind of like in celebration with maybe your friends your colleagues some of your peers, but unfortunately, COVID happened, and we all stopped kind of hanging around each other. So we oh. uh, get to have some of those kind of celebrations with food and drink and stuff like that. But um, yeah, but yeah, no, uh, definitely, you know, Kumis was kind of a you know, very interesting uh, experience, different than you know, I would consider like milk. How an American would see maybe that kind of similar type of drink, but horse was definitely eating horse was quite a culture shock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Karina Sonia. We are switching. You, you mentioned about Kyrgyz and Central Asia in Chicago, like communities. So have you ever visited another countries of Central Asia? For example, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan? You know, and that's a really good question, you know, and, and I have not yet. I'll say yet. Um, and I don't think it really happens by chance. You know, definitely uh, I'll need to be proactive. But, you know, as long as, you know, our environment as we kind of shift back to, you know, resuming kind of normal travel, you know, of people between different places. Uh, I definitely hope to be able to go to and experience other countries within this region because, you know, growing up Central Asia was just, you know, uh, I gotta be honest with you, I mean, it's something that many Americans, you know, they're not very familiar with a lot of the, the countries of Central Asia and, you know, Kazakhstan being one of them. And, you know, growing up in San Francisco, you know, I had, you know, strong Asian cultural influence over me, but it was like East Asian, you know, so I definitely want this experience to be able to visit some other countries of Central Asia. And so I do have plans, maybe um, before some of my work starts, you know, maybe in the summertime, I would be able to visit maybe like one or two countries and maybe even during like the springtime, um, I would be able to maybe visit like another country. But 
I do hope to maybe visit them all. You know, maybe it's ambitious, but uh, I would like to maybe visit all the regions of in countries of Central Asia. Okay, cool. Uh, good luck with traveling and also in Central Asia. Whereas, uh, Lazat, uh, interested on have you ever visited Atrao? I would like to ask, like, here too about Central Asia when you said Atrao is city in uh, Kazakhstan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I do know of it. Um, I, I, I went to um, Aktau, but not um, Aktau. So I, I didn't mm -hmm. go to that one, but so I was uh, in and around the uh, Mingistau region there in Aktau. Um, and I think there are maybe some similarities. Of course, every place is different though, but yeah, but it, not specifically that place, but I have been over uh, to that Western part of Kazakhstan. And it's also Western part. And Almira would like to know, what about Uralsk and Aktobe? Have you visited? Okay. Um, no, um, well, I started uh, with one of my English access groups now in Uralsk. Uh, so mm -hmm. I haven't actually visited there uh, in person um, or Aktobe, but uh, those are definitely places I would really like to travel to, you know, because they're very different regions. Uh, kind of, you know, more further regions away from probably where I'll be at in Nursultan, but um, I definitely plan in my time uh, coming up to be able to visit those places. So generally you're interested in visiting most of the cities in the future, I guess. Uh, thank you. And uh, the next question from Lisa, what are the most difficult situations you have faced in your experience? She didn't mention which experience exactly, but I guess during the traveling? Um, well, during the know, cultural shock? Yeah, I mean, definitely when it comes to traveling, I mean, you know, like I mentioned, the US probably, I mean, for me, you know, probably one of the most consistent type of difficult situations was adapting to weather when I was going to various different places. It's kind of that kind of shock because it is a, a way of life and it is part of the culture whether it shapes people. Um, in Kazakhstan, you know, when it came to maybe like culture shock in a difficult situation, I mean, again, you know, a lot of situations always involve like a language barrier. Typically that's always at the center of a lot of issues. Um, you know, but I mean, there's just a lot of like, you know, daily things that you kind of take for granted, you know, that you don't really think much of, you know, just kind of just simply getting around, you know, and just trying to, you know, purchase simple things, you know, like I, you know, using like Google Translate or other types of translation tools and also a lot of physical kind of, you know, that, that nonverbal kind of communication, pictures, you know, trying to, daily things like trying to choose and find fruit and asking people like in a market about certain things, you know, you know, it, it, that always, you know, just these daily types of things where, you know, kind of difficult at first. And they got easier, of course, like anything, as long as you go through those stages of culture shock where, you know, everything's new, then you're frustrated, then you need to adapt, and then you need to learn how to accept certain things. And, you know, just working through that process, I was able to overcome, you know, like a lot of different situations uh, in Kazakhstan. I'm sure there'll be more when I go back to there. You know, I'm sure there's a lot more new experiences waiting for me. So uh, I'll be ready for them. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, and oh, we have more questions. Okay, I guess we, we will ask two more questions before the end. And one of them is from Nur Sultan. One of the things people from Kazakhstan need to get used while in the US is uh, tipping people for services provided, whether it's for delivery, for restaurant, catering, etc. Uh, what advice would you give to tip people in a way that is fair? I hope you understand what I mean. Okay, you know, um, tip culture is definitely something that can vary around the world. And <clears throat> and yet I've known other um, people from Kazakhstan, you know, that have asked this kind of question too, because, you know, for, for some people in some, some countries, you know, the concept of, you know, tipping like this gratuity type of thing that's added on to, you know, bills and how much do you pay and how do you calculate it? You know, so like in the US, you know, as you know, it's, it's actually something that's, you know, 
you know, it's, it's supposedly, you know, gratuity, like something like, like appreciation or thanks, but it really is something that's kind of mandatory in the U.S. because uh, workers in the service industry, you know, a lot of their salary and their wages do depend upon a certain amount of tips. And so it, it is an important aspect about, you know, the economy and that kind of field and the economics like that. Now, when it comes to like Kazakhstan, this is one of the things of kind of like a little bit of, you know, new experience, maybe culture shock, maybe not. But so in Kazakhstan, a lot of places I found would um, kind of like automatically add in like gratuity, like a tip. Um, it seemed like kind of like a lot of places would do maybe like 10%, um, like in Kazakhstan, a lot of places I went to, you know, but yeah, for those that, you know, visit, you know, because some other countries and cultures, you know, they don't have a tipping culture like at all. You know, so when they go to the U.S., it's like, you know, at first you might appear as being kind of maybe rude, you know, as you get up and leave a table and you don't put a tip, you know, and it's a new experience for you. You know, so uh, I used to work through a lot of business English teaching with Japanese expatriates in Chicago. I worked very closely with a lot of the companies um, there. And that was always one of the biggest questions because like in Japan, they don't have a, a tip culture. You know, so when they would come to the U.S., it's like just, you know, some of them would just, you know, 50% of the bill, you know, they didn't know what to do. You know, they were over tipping or under tipping, you know, so it's kind of this kind of uh, calculations to figure out. But in general, like in the U.S., usually it's like about like 15% of like your um, subtotal, like pre-tax bill, about 15% is for like standard type of good service. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has any to to add about tip culture like in Kazakhstan, but I did see it. And a lot of times it was kind of like added into the bill is what I saw. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, the, I find the next two questions, they will be last. Mm -hmm. The most interesting, uh, I'm interested in that too. So again, I'm asking, do you like ca Kazakh national clothes? Uh, what Kazakh tradition do you know or like? And I would like to also to mix again uh, with the Damir's question. What can you say about national music? Did you play on on our national instrument? As you are a musician on the past, I guess it will be interesting to hear the answer from you. Yeah, uh, yeah, great questions. You know, we can kind of put these together. So, you know, you know, national, you know, clothes and music. Um, mm -hmm. definitely a strong part of people, definitely a strong part of culture, just like weather, you know, those also help to shape, you know, a group and identity of people. Now, first for the music part, yeah, having like a music background, as I discussed in the previous webinars, um, you know, that is something I would like to take up, you know, maybe even uh, potentially learning to play like the gumbra. Now, I don't expect to become like really great, but, you know, at least kind of get the basics and get the experience because, I have tried and played many different instruments in the U.S. Uh, in kind of my music career, um, before I got into business, before I got into teaching. Um, so I've always, I've always thought about actually Kazakh, you know, national music and some of like the traditional instruments. Um, at NIS Kakchikau, many of the students were very terrific. They practiced and played some traditional instruments, and I got to experience a lot of that uh, there. So I was very appreciative of that, and I got to see and learn more. So when I go back to Kazakhstan, music and maybe learning an instrument is something I would like to do as a hobby. Um, when it comes to the clothes, you know, I, I think about like, the, you know, the hat, you know, for uh, Kazakhstan. I, I definitely have seen, you know, traditional attire and clothes. Um, and actually, I kind of, when I went to Almaty, I got to kind of like wear something for like this kind of like tourist kind of photo opportunity. I think I even had like this eagle on my arm, you know, for those you know, maybe in Almaty, or this was like up by uh, um, like Shimbalak, I think, like up there, Madeo, up in that area. So you probably know what I'm talking about, those from like from South Kazakhstan. So, you know, I got to kind of wear traditional clothes. Um, but again, you know, since a lot of celebrations were kind of like cut short and canceled last year when I was in Kazakhstan, you know, I wish I had more opportunity potentially to uh, learn more about some of this. But when I go back to Kazakhstan, again, as well, you know, clothes, I, I would definitely like to learn more about all these different types of, you know, kind of national type of heritage things that make Kazakhstan a very unique, very special 
kind of place. Thank you. We'll be waiting for you, August. Thank you uh, for all our participants for joining us today. Uh, shortly, I would like to remind you our social media where you can uh, check us there, maybe make a stories from today's event, saying, giving uh, feedback for us, how it works. Uh, yeah, and tag us here. Also, you can contact us by WhatsApp or our emails. Uh, and by the way, uh, next Wednesday will be last session. It will be fascinating session about uh, international education experience. So join us next time. Uh, where could we see your recordings on our YouTube channel right here? I'm, yeah, thank you, Lusan. Kazakhstan American Corners, you can see it there. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank Have you. a good night. See you next week. Thank you very much, everyone.